how does desire come to desire its own repression? And in order to attack the prisons, you have to attack first the legitimacy, the identities, the representations that have convinced us, I guess, that those are legitimate institutions. Welcome to the Non-Servium Podcast, a project dedicated to exploring the world of anarchist and anti-authoritarian ideas. Join us in our conversations with radical voices in precarious times. To view our full catalog, visit our website at nonserviummedia.com. If you'd like to support the show, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviummedia. Remember to like, share, and subscribe to help spread the word, and so you can stay updated with our most recent episodes. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoy. Hey there, everyone. Welcome to the non Servium Podcast. I'm your host, Joel Williamson, and you are listening to the 33rd episode of the show. If the thought of an anarchist meme page with 40,000 followers and post-structural illegalist characteristics sounds interesting, then you'll likely enjoy today's episode. Here's my interview with the ghost of old Benjamin Tucker. Ghost is the admin and producer of one of the coolest meme pages on the internet. She's also a guitarist, a skateboarder, and a Spinozacist anarchist. Ghost, welcome to the show. Hi. Glad to be here. How are you? This vaccine is kind of kicking my butt. Woke up a little, uh, like, fevery and stuff today, so... But I'm okay. Did you just get your second shot? Yeah, it's my second one, so uh, it was, you know, I got it too late. But uh, better late than never, I guess. But yeah, it's yeah, ugh, it's kicking my butt today. But I'm definitely glad to have it, and that's a good thing. So you know, you are very brave because when I got it, I was out of commission all day. <laughs> Period. When I, my, my second dose kicked my ass. So yeah, you're a fucking trooper. If you're, I don't know. I guess it affects everyone differently, huh? I, you know, I didn't think it would, like yesterday I was feeling okay, but I woke up today. I'm glad I don't work today because I definitely would have been calling in. So, um, and I need that money. So, (laughs) yeah, but uh, yeah. So it's funny, me and the rest of the crew have been a big fan of you and your work for a long time. And it was, I can't remember if it, I think it was a few months ago. Someone was like, you really need to see if you can... I mean, it was a while back, actually. You need to see whether or not you can, if we can interview the ghost of old Benjamin Tucker or, who, or whoever creates those memes, because they're awesome. And I was like, well, that sounds great, but like, how do you do this detective work to, in order to make it happen? And <laughs> I, I guess just accidentally, I wasn't even like searching you out. I think you might have posted a selfie on Facebook and then also on Twitter something like that and then I put two and two together and I I thought I'm just gonna take a risk and ask this person (laughs) whether or not they're the admin and sure enough you were and so here we are (laughs) that's that's funny I was actually on Grindr the other day and somebody definitely was like hey um are you the ghost of Benjamin Tucker (laughs) (laughs) famous you're famous yeah that was that was (laughs) First experience with that. We'll see. Uh, but yeah. That's really flattering, though. Uh, it's kind of crazy to think that anyone would, uh, you know, it's it's just kind of been a, a very personal page that I started, and I'm kind of just surprised that anyone pays attention, I guess, or even, you know, like likes it, I guess. I, I don't know. That's, that's really flattering. Well, um, to anyone unfamiliar with you and your work, could you elaborate on who you are and how you found yourself operating one of the spiciest anarchist meme pages online? I mean, I don't think I'm anybody. Like, you know, people often accuse me of being a student or something, and I, I'm definitely not. I had a few uh, convictions, I guess, that I guess when you get arrested for weed, they cut off your funding. So um, definitely not a student. I literally just work full time. I'm just trying to make a living and 
make something in this world, I guess. Uh, make it get something better, you know, than what we got. So that's really it. I I, um, I started it as a kind of a personal page for me to just kind of process what I what I read or I'm thinking about. I don't know. I, I you know I I see these memes and I just start to think like it, it helps me to process what I'm reading in terms of those memes, I guess. And a lot of times it, you know, kind of like highlight areas that I'm confused about or like that I, that I haven't really pieced together yet. And yeah, it was, it was really just a place for me to kind of express that and get it out somehow because I needed to. So yeah, I guess that's how it started. Cool. Cool. Well, I guess I first came across your page on Facebook and I have always had at least a part-time interest in like continental philosophy, postmodern philosophy and stuff like that. I also happen to love Benjamin Tucker and have called myself something of an individualist anarchist for a while now. And so your page was talking shit about politicians and it was bringing up Baudrillard and it was referencing these provocative individualist ideas at the same time. So I was like, this is where I need to be. I felt at home when I saw your memes. So, But for, for anyone who hasn't seen your work, who hasn't actually been to the page and, and, and seen what you do, how would you describe what the ghost of old Benjamin Tucker is as a project? Good question. I don't know that I have kind of any overarching goal or anything. I mean, like I said, it's kind of just, it was really just a personal kind of expression page <laughs> that I've, you know, it's kind of taken off, I guess in a way I didn't expect. What kind of memes do you do? What kind of memes? Mostly, I mean, you know, <laughs> I, I just see something in the wild and I, and I go, how can that be, you know, how can I reappropriate that, you know, and take its kind of meaning and, you know, subvert it a little bit. And I mean, I don't know. I don't know what the, what the what, if I have a general, like, <laughs> you know, approach or whatever, but. I do like some ironic or kind of ironic, I guess, uh, large text memes. That's kind of something I like to do. But um, Yeah. Yeah, I mean. Well, if you're open to it, I want to sort of break down some of the memes that you've made just to give our audience a, a taste of what it is that you do. Right on. But before we get into all that and everything, do you make all the memes yourself? I would say like 90%. Well, there's definitely... Sometimes I'll just post a Twitter take that I liked or something that I found in the wild that maybe, I guess, needed a, a new audience, I guess, or, or the, the kind of fit the, fit the theme of the page somehow. Cool. And how did you choose the name, The Ghost of Old Benjamin Tucker? <laughs> That's a good question. So there was a page at the time, you may remember it. I don't think it's active anymore. The, uh, the Ghost of Old Dale Earnhardt. You remember that one? <laughs> yes. I, I used to love that one. And it was... Um, that was a while back. I guess it was one of the first ones that just... It was, I guess, popular at the time. And I, I was liking it. One of my favorites, I guess. And I also happened to like, you know, I was reading Benjamin Tucker. And I thought he was kind of a good representation of this kind of like intersection between like market and egoism, I guess. And I guess that's why I kind of picked him. But yeah. I don't know. I just put it, put it together. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. I love it. It's like, um, it's obscure and there's a certain type of person who would think it's funny. And when you see it, you know, it's funny. I don't know how to explain it. It's like, like, it's not a joke for everyone's ears, I guess. Kind of uh, esoteric in a, in a sense, I guess. Right, right. To this point, you've largely kept your identity vague. You've told me in private that you've done this intentionally in order to ward off any social capital that may result from operating the ghost of old Benjamin Tucker. How does one contribute to the general discourse of anarchy while warding off any social capital that may come with it? I mean, a simple answer is I don't know. I mean, I think it's a process of figuring that out. I don't think that there's one universal answer for everybody. I think it depends on, depends on who you are. One thing that comes to mind, I guess, immediately is like, I'm not a big fan of watermarks. I'm not a big fan of like intellectual property. I don't know. At the same time, I, I don't want to like avoid accountability, I guess, you know, like, I, I don't know. It's, it's definitely something I go back and forth on. I don't know. I don't know that I have any good answers, to be honest. The only thing I can really think of is in my case of memes is, you know, 
not having watermarks or, or things like that that kind of display a kind of intellectual property, I guess. Well, what is it that makes you skeptical of social capital to begin with? Well, I mean, it's the same, same as capital, I guess. Social capital is it's something that can be used to build hierarchy whenever you can accumulate enough of it. And so it, I think it's very important to definitely just ward off whatever you can in any way. I don't, you know, I, like I said, I don't think I have all the answers or anything, but getting rid of watermarks, I think. Let's abolish them. <laughs> That's a, yeah, a world beyond watermarks. There you go. And an election property. Right. So how would you describe your personal political convictions and how did you arrive at them? That's a good question. Like, I'm firmly an anarchist. You know, I, I try to be syncretic of a few different, like, I, you know, things that from anarchists that I don't exactly, or people that I don't think are anarchists explicitly, but, you know, still kind of parallel that. So I like to take from, you know, I just find lots of insights from, you know, people like Foucault and um, Deleuze and Guattari and even some of the situationists that I think provide insight to anarchism. So I kind of ask it to be better, I guess. And you said, how did I, how did I get here? That's a good question. Honestly, I was raised like extremely like right wing religious. It was a, it was a long process of unlearning a lot of things. Mm -hmm. And I don't really know what started it all or anything, but I definitely started sort of libertarian. And once I kind of dropped some of those conservative things, kind of moved just to libertarian and then kind of really discovered anarchism and just keep reading and finding lots of things that I think kind of inform anarchism, I guess. I have a feeling that maybe your religious upbringing was similar to mine. Were, were you raised in Texas? Yeah, I was raised in the Church of Christ. Okay. Yeah, it, it, it sucked. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's a very uh, it's decentralized, like every every church is kind of like formally in charge of its own. And there's not like a central leadership or anything, but it's a very conservative, very like women can't do any kind of teaching or any kind of like service except like teaching Bible class or something and cooking, you know, so very conservative, run by a group of elders, deacons and just. It was an awful, toxic environment. And when I broke away to college, I was finally able to, I guess, stop going to some degree. And I also got access to the Internet and was like, wow, OK, there's so much information out here. Uh, <laughs> unmoderated Internet so that I wasn't, you know, it was it was very restricted at the house. We had one. I don't know if you remember. We had one of those TV. What was it? TV Guardians or something. My it, my parents just had passwords on things. I didn't have like a guardian, but. Zero 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 gave me access to MTV, BET, and all the other channels you're not supposed to have access to. <laughs> nice, nice. Yeah, I definitely, I learned to be real good at being sneaky and definitely like having to do things on your own. But yeah, it was, it was definitely a, a bad environment for sure. And definitely a product of Texas for sure. <laughs> right, right. A special kind of conservative religiosity, I guess, that... If you didn't patriotism. patriotism, totally. Yeah. That's just a cardinal sin. It's like, you know, agree with the wars or not, you're going to thank the troops kind of patriotism. <laughs> I think, exactly. Like I, it's, it's, my parents have said some awful things and we are really not in a good place. You know, we don't really communicate too much. So I'm sorry. It's all good. I, you know, I'm in a much better place. I'm on my own and doing my thing and I'm happy and learning and unlearning a lot of things that they taught me so yeah hell yeah so it's a good feeling fuck yeah good for you <laughs> well your page is named after one of the most popular individualist anarchists you said earlier that one of the reasons you chose benjamin tucker as the name for the meme page was because you were reading him at the time but from what i can tell you don't seem to stand markets so why is that i definitely like i'm not like anti-market like i don't think that exchange needs to be like eliminated or something what i what i like is distributed networks and i i think that you can have those without some of the market baggage i guess if you will mm -hmm. like i said i'm not like anti-market or anything but i definitely don't think i don't think that we can conflate it with anarchism and say that you know this process is anarchism you know it's I think personally, we'll see a lot more sharing than kind of the traditional kind of exchange or the, the exchange that we're used to, I guess, the predominant form of that, I guess. 
once the state falls away, I guess, or once it's abolished. I see the market as a a tool to be used. And like, I feel like as long as it's truly libertarian and that it's something that you can use but don't have to depend on, then it's like obviously yeah. anarchist. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the best kind of market anarchism to me, I think um, Lucio or sorry, U-R-T-A-B-E. Um, oh, I don't know if I know how to pronounce that either. He was a kind of expropriate, like he used, he forged checks and things like he really, really got one over on Citigroup, I think it was, uh, Citibank. And anyway, he funded liberation projects through doing that. And I think when you're talking about that kind of market activity, absolutely. I'm, I'm mm-hmm. that's, that's awesome. That's, I mean, really just inspiring, really. I'm not totally familiar with who that person is and what they did. Can you, can you expound on that? What did you, what did you say their name was? Lucio Ertabe, I guess that would be. They did like some insurrectionary shit or something? Yeah, like he he basically just forged checks. I think he robbed some banks maybe. like <laughs> Robbing bank kind of market anarchism you're down with. Yeah, I mean, you know, if you're, if you're expropriating that wealth, you know, I am, I am all for that kind of market. <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> awesome. So... Some non-market anarchists are sympathetic to democracy, but based off some of the memes uh, you've made, I got to think that you're probably critical of that as well. So what's your take on democracy? Um, okay, so similar to similar to markets, I, I think it's a process that we should not be conflated with anarchism. I think what we want is a content of anarchism. You know, where those processes come in is something, I guess, to be determined, but I think at bottom, at, at bottom, we want anarchy, not democracy. Now, I also do have some other takes on democracy about just it being kind of a nationalist. It has a nationalist temptation that is strongly correlated with and, and easily appropriated by, I guess, nationalism. And I don't know. I just, I just think that there's a lot, even, even when you're talking about the most direct of democracies, you're still talking about, you know, establishing a uh, legitimate identity out of which one contributes to this participatory mm-hmm. democracy, I guess. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's a lot of directions to go there based off of what you just said. Some of it reminds me of Deleuze and Guattari's problems with static identity, which hopefully we can get around to a little later also. Absolutely. That is, yes. Destroying those kind of fixed representations is... It's definitely a different approach than your kind of more traditional anarchism, I think. But mm-hmm. I think it's a more comprehensive anarchism, I guess. Attacking those like fixed representations that power produces, I guess, rather than trying to liberate the oppressed subject. There's not a transcendental subject identity that's being repressed by power. It's, it's about attacking the fixed representations of identity that power rests on. Yeah. So both the uh, democracy and markets are a process, but a fixed process that comes out of power and also is incapable of extending beyond it. Is that accurate to say, or am I still not understanding fully? Um, <laughs> sorry, do you mind just repeating that one for me? Yeah. So just sort of like combining your critique of markets and democracy, you see them both as processes. And it seems to me that you value Mm -hmm. the content over the process. So it's like, you shouldn't be fighting for healthcare, you should be fighting for health. And in the same way, like, I guess, fixed processes bleed out of power. And because of that are incapable of transcending beyond it. Yeah, I mean, I I think I'm trying to think of a quote that Mal Testa had, you know, even, even he was pretty critical. Actually, I really think, I think this, the kind of start of this whole, like, I, I don't think traditionally anarchists were big on democracy. I think from Proudhon to Mal Testa, like I said, are actually more critical of democracy than some of the more contemporary takes, I guess. And I think it really, mm-hmm. I, I don't, you know, I don't want to scapegoat, but I definitely think a big thing, a big change that happened 
was due to Hook Chen, you know, who kind of played an anarchist in his youth, I guess, but, you know, eventually came to kind of reject that and mm-hmm. kind of get more into democracy, I guess. And I guess that was, it's really where I see the start of an embrace of democracy with anarchists. But gosh, that's probably different than what you were asking, but... Um. <laughs> no, 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 that's still, that's still, it's interesting to, it's definitely important to point out how anarchist history didn't start at Bookchin. And I don't think it's a straw man to, to think that Anarchists, for whatever reason, have kind of um, been short-sighted by that monopolization of thought within it. Not that Bookchin cultivated all by himself, but that he contributed toward, I guess. So if you don't stand markets and aren't the biggest fan of democracy either, what are your thoughts on civilization? Again, not really like big anti or pro, I guess. I think it just depends on... You know, whenever a lot of people hear anti-civ, they go, oh, you don't want people living close together or something? And I, I mean, maybe, and maybe some, you know, kind of primitivists, I guess, do kind of. I would say maybe even some anti-civs, I don't know. But uh, I think I think whenever you're talking about some of the more better takes I think the anti-civ has is about the roles that were assigned in a civilization. And whenever we're, you know, there's a way of organizing and interacting without being a civilization and all the accompanying roles and hierarchy and whatever else. Mm-hmm. So I'm not like anti it. I'm, I'm definitely like, you know, let's take where we're at and subvert it and try to get some, try to get something better or something deeper. You know, I, I'm not a, a strong community kind of thing. I, I definitely don't really get with that. <laughs> but, um, mm-hmm. you know, I think I guess there's just modes of interrelating that I think aren't markets, aren't democracy, aren't civilization as we know it. And I think it's it's a process of uncovering those and discovering them and producing them and, you know, experimenting with that, I guess. Okay, so we just did two podcast episodes that focused largely on complexity. That was a theme that ran in and out of it. We spoke with William Gillis, and then we have Jason Lee Bias also that's going to come out this Saturday should be out by the time this is released. But yeah, complexity was one theme that ran in and out of it. And that's one aspect of your philosophy that it seems that you're embracing as well. Only I think you're applying it consistently to the individual and starting there rather than starting at society. And again, trying to break beyond the boundaries of static identity. Yeah, yeah, that's something I like out of Gillis, actually. One of my favorite things that he talks about. But yeah, just like the the kind of complexity and things like that. I definitely kind of maybe have a different kind of post-structural approach a little bit. But I mean, I think it's syncretic, I guess. So do you consider yourself post-left? My take on things tends to be more aligned with what the post-left has been making, I guess. Their kind of critiques. I don't know that I'm like explicitly like post left. I definitely don't really get with kind of the left or whatever. I don't know. I think it could be described that way, but I don't necessarily think it's like some kind of label that I'm trying to like conform to, I guess. Of course not. Of course not. Yeah, there's elements of it though that seem obvious to me that run in and out of your work. Yeah. Yeah. But I love that you don't want to be boxed in. Yeah. You're not post left, but you are influenced by some aspects of the post left. Yes, yes, exactly. Yeah. Right. Definitely find a lot of their critiques useful for dissolving, criticizing, unmasking hierarchy, I guess. One critique of post-left anarchy is that it doesn't offer explicit proposals for post-state coordination. So basically it gets to shit on other ideologies without offering any practical alternatives to other proposals made by anarchists, I guess, brave enough to try to ponder how such a thing might work. Do you think that's a fair critique? I think it's actually its advantage. Hmm. My favorite quote that Deleuze has, I think, is, I leave it to you to find a weapon or find your weapon. And I think that's its advantage. It doesn't prescribe a kind of program. It doesn't prescribe an identity for you. That needs to be liberated, like in the case of like Feuerbach or Marx, even with his spe- with their species being, you know, 
or on the other side, you know, the rational consumer maybe of the more classical, I guess, economics. Yeah, I think that's its advantage, you know, that it doesn't prescribe anything for you. It leaves it up to you, up to us, you know, to determine between ourselves. And I think that's its, its, its advantage, that the, that the content, it's determined by us, you know, by our experience and by the way we live directly, you know? Yeah. Okay. Well, there's a lot of moving parts in our existing world that make our enjoyment of your memes possible. For instance, the internet has to exist. We have to have a reliable device that can give us access to social media, etc. How do you propose, and it's okay if you don't have a specific proposal, but I'm curious what your thoughts generally were sort of more specific than distributed networks maybe. How do you propose we cooperate in a way that ensures that we get access to your meme page in a world beyond the state and capitalism? I mean, like you said, I don't, I don't have like a specific program about, hey, well, you know, this is exactly what we're going to do. Um, but I fundamentally think that we're being prevented from, from establishing that kind of society, you know, through, through law and all that kind of thing. I saw you mention rhizomatic production once. What might that have to do with some of this? It's a good question. I mean, you're talking about like distribution, I guess, and like mm-hmm. producing and, and things like that. I would really like to get rid of the factory model. I tend to lean more on the kind of craft side of anarchism, I guess. Okay. But again, like, I, you know, I, I think it's going to be, I think we're going to have kind of our needs. We're not going to need to meet rent. So there's going to be a lot more just sharing, like sharing information, obviously sharing like resources and things like that, because they're not managed the way that they are right now. You know, I, I just think that there's ways of relating that aren't established by an authority. I mean, we you talk about rhizomes and stuff, but, you know, the the authority is a tree. It's a tree root structure, you know, and that's hmm. that's what I find was just fundamentally anarchist about. I mean, I know Deleuze and Guattari do you say that they're Marxists, but their work is fundamentally anti-state. It's 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 a very comprehensive form of anarchism, I guess. You know, without without the tree root system, without that authority, without that hierarchy, there's so many ways of relating to one another, like spontaneously and and without the right to be obeyed, the right to command. I don't know if there's a, I have a specific proposal about how the form should look, but I definitely think it's going to be a lot more, it's going to be a lot better. There's, there's going to be ways and they're going to be much easier to access, I guess, mm-hmm. to produce these things, to distribute them, and to log on to my meme page and check it out. So, <laughs> <laughs> Hell yeah. Well, as long as like, As long as your meme page exists in your ideal world, then I'm willing to explore that as well. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. We'll keep we'll keep doing it until I until I get tired of it, I guess. But you know. (laughs) (laughs) Well, at that point, it would be socially necessary work that we we would force you to do. (laughs) There there you go. That's that's you know that's fair. (laughs) (laughs) But you'll impose it on yourself. See, that would be the thing. Is like at that point. You would have internalized like the need to uh, provide for everyone else and to sacrifice to your own detriment, you know, to provide for everyone else's enjoyment of it. I mean, you know, <laughs> that does that does sound really selfish. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely it was it was an interesting question. Whenever whenever you asked that, I, I I definitely was like, I don't know that you know. At first, I was like, will we need my main page? You know. And then, <laughs> You know, I mean, uh, but then again, you know, I don't think it's about some kind of final revolution where we get to some kind of Mm -hmm. anarchist society and now we're free of everything. And, you know, we're, you know, it's like some kind of heaven or something where we just, you know, adopted down to down to here, I guess. Um, Mm -hmm. I I don't I don't think it's going to be like that. I think it's there's definitely going to be continuing issues and it's definitely going to be something to keep criticizing and unmasking. And, you know, we'll keep doing it. (laughs) Yeah. All right. So who are some of your favorite non-anarchist philosophers that you've been influenced by and that have also influenced your work? I mean, I mentioned them before. I mean, Deleuze and Guattari, I think, are probably two that I've really found a lot of affinities, I guess, that I share. I mean, their, their work is definitely like, it's a bit odd. It's a bit out there. 
getting into it can be confusing, but I, I think it's completely deliberate on their part and kind of subverts almost themselves um, in a way. To me, I think I said it before, but I mean, you know, they, they talk about the trees and they even talk about the nomadic war machine, which is they basically took Nietzsche's overmen, I guess, and formulated, you know, said, what would this look like in a social organization? And they talk, so this nomadic war machine is, is fundamentally like opposed to the state. Obviously, it, gets, it can be appropriated. We're not saying that they're like, you know, entirely like exclusive to one another or anything. But to me, it was just, it was just a totally anarchist take, you know, to, to sit here and try to form a social organization that's, you know, horizontal, that's rhizomatic in their, in their terms, that is distributed, not just decentralized. And also just like we talked about the post left stuff, another one of their kind of big things is talking about, you know, how does desire desire its own repression? And their take on that, I guess, is to attack forms of representation like the Oedipal complex, I guess is one of their big ones. You know, they have anti-Oedipus, you know, as as their first part of capitalism and schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing is just about saying that there is no Oedipal subject. They really describe Freud as kind of imposing a narrative and assigning meaning to every experience, you know, and being able to assign to this one thing, you know, and that to me was like another form of like hierarchy, I guess. And I love their critiques. So making my way through some of their works, especially Deleuze, some of his kind of Burks and time related stuff. Uh, (laughs) Deleuze was a really smart guy. It was really impressive. Yeah, I, I definitely recommend any anarchist to check them out. You know, I've probably talked too much, but Nietzsche, who called Antonio Negri, was another one that I've liked, found some common characteristics, I guess, with, or uh, goals, I guess. Actually, I guess Max Stirner, I mean, you know, I guess he wasn't explicitly an anarchist, but I, I think that he provided an attack on the hierarchy, I guess, of, you know, that stood on this species being, you know, that he, he basically just deconstructed the kind of Feuerbachian humanist approach, I guess, of liberating man, you know, capital man from inverting the God man thing and just saying, okay, now we're, we're not going to get rid of the God man hierarchy. We're just going to invert it and put man up top. Yeah. Not touching the fundamental structure. Yeah. Yeah. And I just, I, I mean, I, I just think it's fun. You know, he talks about workers taking power and, you know, taking over and, um, Labor is free when the state is gone, I think. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So. And liberating experience, like your own, even down to your own experience, you know, and, and I just think his attack on the representation of species being was just fundamentally anarchist. It was, it was all about destroying those forms of power that the kind of left Hegelians were kind of trying to build, I guess, the kind of humanist kind of institutions, I guess. Yeah, I think those are some of my favorites. Do you view what you do as fitting into neo-situationism? And if so, how so? And what does that really mean? I mean, like I said before, I don't think there's any kind of overarching goal. I definitely think you could, it could be described that way. Like, I think descriptively, yeah, you could absolutely say it's about transcending art, you know, and, and trying to make, mm-hmm. trying to reintegrate art from its kind of separation from where we've kind of made it, I guess. And taking images and media and kind of subverting their intended meaning to kind of foster a kind of critical attitude, a kind of spontaneous critical attitude about our institutions, I guess. But yeah, I think you could definitely fit it in there. Like I said, I don't think it's something I try to do or anything, but definitely. Going back to Deleuze and Guattari, specifically anti Oedipus. My read on that is that, again, they're challenging us to avoid static identity and embrace um, a mentally nomadic way of becoming, and that this makes you illegible and able to avoid capture. Is that an accurate interpretation? Yeah. Another quote from theirs is they said, bring something incomprehensible into this world. Mm -hmm. It's definitely something I've taken taken to heart. What does that mean in practical language? In practical language. Um, you know what I mean? Because it's like very beautiful poetry, and I feel like I understand it. But it almost seems like just a metaphor for like James C. Scott's illegibility. 
like a psychological metaphor, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I get it. I get it. I definitely can see how it might come off that way. Okay, so in practical language, um, yeah, I mean, they do have a very kind of poetic language. Artful and playful and highly enjoyable, too. It's incredible. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's, that's what I find really so intriguing about it, I guess. And, and so it's like they put these little traps in their own little book to kind of subvert it. And I, I just think it's really clever. But, you know, what are they about? Um, bring something incomprehensible into this world. It, it definitely is, like you said. I mean, I, I wouldn't say to avoid capture. You know, it, it wards off capture. There's definitely still capture that's possible, I guess. And it's about how we form these, you know, the social organization. Like, to me, it's, it's fundamentally about, you know, whenever we talk about, like, anarchists and their, uh, like, uh, affinity unions, that's, to me, uh, one of the best examples I can think of. You know, we, when we talk about, like, Black Bloc or something, like, that, to me, is a spontaneous, like, rhizomatic social organization you know, that's happening, that occurs, gosh, I'm trying, like you said, I'm trying to use practical language. It's like spontaneous, it's leaderless, it's stigmergic. Yeah, it's... yeah, Stigmer stigmergic, yes, is, a, is what yeah. I tried to, tried to uh, say a little bit more. That, that it's is a beautiful a word. word. I, say, I say it five times a day. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a nice one. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I I just think I just think you know whenever I read the losing Butari, the, the first things I think of whenever I think of a nomadic war machine is is those black block out on the out on the streets, you know, or organizing together without a hierarchy, without a like original point, without a conclusion. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I mean, that kind of seems on a practical level, spontaneous networks of attack seem to be completely outside of the bounds of what what hierarchy could ward off it seems it seems oh yeah 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 yeah. it's you know, yeah. whenever you're whenever you're the more you can't be interpreted the more you can't be managed you know the more you can't be seen and you know observed i guess you know in, in the Foucaultian sense <laughs> mm -hmm. that's what being ungovernable is exactly exactly and it's like not just a tactic to achieve statelessness but like let's say once we are in statelessness it's like this is a way of being in order to avoid the re-emergence of hierarchy exactly that is that is like everything that the nomadic war machine is about it wards off perpetually you know not without like fail or anything obviously like you know it can, it can be like i said it can be appropriated by the state in fact the army is is kind of the appropriated nomadic war machine but uh, and I'm sorry, I just got on a random little, whenever you were asking about Benjamin Tucker mm -hmm. and how it kind of shows that, I guess. And it's, it's something that I think in the same sense that Deleuze and Guattari were admittedly Marxist, they just happened to leave off, you know, they happened to omit much of Marx, like the dialectical contradiction, you know, the dictatorship of the proletariat. You know, all the worst parts, I think, and then seem to improve on his best parts. And I think that's maybe where I'm where I'm kind of coming from on, on kind of Benjamin Tucker um, is, is in a similar maybe, way. Yeah. Like omitting some of the some of the stuff that I think is maybe, you know, not the strongest and maybe improving on insights that he had, you know, regarding like monopoly and things like that. And like, you know, um, yeah, I don't know. I guess that's my take on that. But sorry, I know that's probably related to another question. It's all good. No, I like it. I like it. This doesn't have to be super orderly. You know, this is... <laughs> it's, it's a rhizo. It's a rhizo. How do you do like a rhizomatic podcast? That seems like... Um, I, I've got this formula now. I'm so utterly predictable and like the opposite of... At this point, like, I am an algorithm. And... <laughs> um, I, you know, I don't know. I think it's... I feel like it's... I don't know that podcasts are necessarily like tree-like or anything, so yeah. I don't know. Did they use the term schizo politics or schizo event? Part of their whole thing is is saying that you know these events happen, and they're rather than trying to interpret these events in terms of like you know trying to find an an origin in order to kind of locate its conclusion. It's about establishing. 
I mean, uh, ce- ceaselessly establish connections between these, you know, structures of power. And, and it's, it's like a, it's just kind of a different take on analyzing it, I guess. And the one that, one that, uh, in their, in their words, apprehends multiplicities, you know, one that doesn't assign, like, like I said, like an overall meaning, you know, uh, in the sense of like a meta narrative to it, I guess. So absolutely. There's an understanding of that, that is schizophrenic, I guess. It seems amoral. It seems like um, to embrace a, I guess, a schizo mindset politically, it doesn't say that you arrive at liberation. It seems to me to be like a weapon that could be used for any random type of amoral end, if that makes sense. And maybe I'm misreading it. Again, I'm, I'm fairly ignorant of it, but it seems to me like a lot of the right like the intellectual right has picked up on some elements of Deleuze and Guattari and they see like the power structure, the existing power structure is being compromised by like center left progressive attitudes. So they take like Deleuze and Guattari and use it as a tool against that. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, your critique is nothing unheard of. I'm going to be honest. I don't know how to pronounce his last name. I'm B-A-D-I-O-U. Alan. He was, he kind of accused, the losing Guattari definitely, I think they call it the, the fascism of the potato. It's definitely something that I haven't probably need to re- read more on, but I think, yeah, absolutely. These, these things can be appropriated by fascists, but I think on the, on the other side of that, the revolutionary kind of possibilities are, are just uh, ir- irresistible, I guess, you know, it's some, something that's very useful, something that we can absolutely use to inform our anarchism. All right. Well, let's let's move forward a little bit. I have some a couple questions about propaganda and art. I consider you a dark art magician engaging in a medium that exists somewhere in between high propaganda and just pure art. You kind of combine those worlds in a way. What do you think of like the power of memes as propaganda? Like I said, it's kind of a surprise to me that anybody like likes any any of the content or anything like that or has found some kind of like affinity with that, I guess. Really a surprise to me and it honestly feels makes me feel really good whenever people kind of say kind of give me some feedback about like, wow, you know, hey, I this was something I didn't know about and I appreciate that you've shown me this because it's kind of like helped me kind of grow my anarchism, kind of like helped me kind of critique something, I guess. And mm-hmm. it's definitely encouraging. It's definitely something that I'm I'm like, oh gosh, like I'm actually like pro- helping, you know, <laughs> provide like a site. Like, what is what? Hell what? Yeah. Like, I, I don't know. Like, I really, like I said, I'm just all, constantly surprised and constantly just in awe of, of um, and just so appreciative of people for reaching out and you know um, expressing some kind of admiration or something. It's 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 mind boggling to me. Um, but I find it flattering, I guess, um, and just trying to keep doing doing what I'm doing, processing my reading. And if it helps others see some things or be introduced to some things or maybe think about things in a new way along the way, like that's just a side benefit, I guess. I'm gonna, this is probably an unpopular opinion, but I think, I don't, I don't know if you've ever read Eric Hoffer. Um, he's another non-anarchist, I guess, that's kind of had an influence in my thinking. His whole thing is about mass movements. And his thesis is basically that the mass movements are interchangeable whether national, religious, social, or whatever, they're interchangeable in the sense that they, their efficacy has to do with personal sentiment of guilt and blame and that, that people arrive to at some point, I guess. And anyway, his whole thing, what, what, he kind of speaks in a lot of aphorisms and stuff. And one thing he says is propaganda serves more to convince ourselves than to convince others. And, and it, maybe that comes off a bit cynical at first, but I think that there's a reading of that that can, maybe as anarchists, we, we need some reassurance and maybe, oh, yeah. maybe it's, um, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't think that, I think propaganda has no effect on people whose minds aren't already in a state where they're receptive to it, I guess. And I think that's mm-hmm. maybe where I'm at is, you know, I'm kind of talking to anarchists and stuff. So they're kind of like already kind of, leaning that way and just kind of like you know maybe maybe they just haven't maybe there's some things that they realize that just haven't worked out in their 
you know, kind of thought through anarchism, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, no, I like that. I think that's clearly true. I also didn't really mention it, but I think the, the main point is just propaganda for my own sake, just kind of helping me figure out things and reassuring myself of things. And, and that's probably my, my take on that, I guess. Yeah, totally. Propaganda of the me? I don't know. That's, that's <laughs> um, uh, Yeah. <laughs> so who is a philosopher that you just mentioned? What was his name again? Eric Hoffer. Hoffer. So you just said that Hoffer's take might sound cynical. What role should cynicism and comedy play in anarchist art? That's a good question. I see that theme sort of inter interweaved throughout some of your memes. Like, obviously comedy is there, but a cyn <laughs> like a, a cynicism of, like, the, uh, of the status quo and of unquestioned narratives and of sacred things that people take for granted. You, 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 you sort of like cynically shoot at them. <laughs> is, it, is it cynically though? I don't know. Um... And, and it's probably not cynical. That's actually not like a good word. I just find your critique so piercing that it might appear cynical to someone who holds those beliefs. Okay, yeah, I can, I can see that. I definitely get accused of, you know, oh yeah, you're just going to criticize everything and not, you know, like... No, 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 yeah. I don't, I don't think, for instance, that like criticizing the idea of policing and punishment is cynical, but someone who thinks that institution is sacred might, might interpret it as that. Yeah, I can see that. They go, okay, so you think... Then you must think people are... are I don't know how you would describe it, selfish or something like that. You know, that that's why they're doing that. What was what was the other thing you said, cynicism? Comedy. Comedy. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Comedy. <laughs> I don't know. I'm going to be honest. I, I don't know if I've developed a good answer to this one. Um, okay. That's totally fine. A lot of your memes are funny, and that's one of the reasons why they work so well. Like, everyone's probably familiar with the person on an image who's crying and he's talking about how, like, I think the meme originated with, like, bro, this is, it's a different type of weed. You have to try this other type of weed, bro, please. That's the reason you got paranoid. <laughs> that's the way I, like, hear him. Yeah. Like, just an annoying, weird friend who's insisting that you smoke weed when yeah. you always get paranoid <laughs> when you do it. You don't want to. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah. So you use, you use that format. And I'm going to read it in the voice that I hear it. This is your meme. This is what it reads on the meme. Bro, please, unjustified hierarchies gave you anxiety. You need to try justified hierarchies. It's a different strain. Bro, please, no one ever justified those hierarchies. That's why you got all paranoid. Please, I swear, it's more of a body hierarchy. <laughs> We just we just have to rationalize them and pathologize resistance to them. <laughs> That's hilarious. I mean, it speaks for itself. What what stirred you to make that meme? I think it's a sentiment that has gotten more popular since Noam Chomsky. I think initially said it. I think his quote was about um, never heard of him. <laughs> Noam Chomsky. <laughs> yeah, what, what a um, obscure reference. Um, <laughs> But yeah, he, um, he, I think his quote was like about, you know, hierarchies need to be justified. You know, that's what I want to see. I want to see, you know, we got to be justifying the hierarchies. If they're not justified, then they can't survive, I guess. And, and, you know, his, his example was bizarrely, like, I don't, I don't understand like how a supposed Anson can kind of like come up with a, a definition of hierarchy that means like shoving a kid out of the street. <laughs> <laughs> that to me is just so, so broad of a term. It's it's the same sense that <laughs> Leninists use authority. You know, they say, oh well, you know, authority is basically anytime you you don't heed someone else's. You know what I mean? Like you you don't authority is anytime you do anything. Basically, it's anytime you breathe and you know what I mean. Like they they have such broad yeah definitions that it just it doesn't even. I mean, the high, like you, you can shove a kid out of a street, you know, if it, uh, oncoming car or whatever, um, without having control over this kid or something. And I think that's where a lot of anarchists kind of struggle is is they come around to this. Oh yeah, no hierarchy. Actually, wait a minute. The kid and the parent. Mm, eh, we can justify that one. And I think that's just the start of it. You know, if if we're gonna start there, then why not? Why not be 
like the ANCAPs do and say, well, okay, the, the one between the boss and the worker is justified, you know? Mm-hmm. I, I just fundamentally think it's a, it's a misunderstanding that Chomsky has perpetuated, and it's really kind of um, harmed anarchism, I guess. Well, it's not justified because it's not democratic. It's very clear. It's always been there. <laughs> no, yeah, I, I, it's very, you know, I, it, it's not even clear. You know, he talks about, you know, we got to justify them. Like, who's justifying them? You know, like, who's... Yeah. Uh, ju- uh, that hierarchy has always been justified by those who are... are in control of the hierarchy, you know, mm-hmm. um, they've always been justified. So to sit here and say, oh, no, actually just unjustified ones, like all hierarchies are justified by someone, you know, mm-hmm. I don't know if he proposes having some kind of official regulating structure, uh, you know, that's going to um, justify hierarchies or not, you know, that's, yeah. that to me is just totally not anarchist. And I don't know, you know, it's, it's something that I think we need to be critical of. Maximizing justified hierarchies. Is where you could end up with that. Exactly. You know, if we're going to start there, why not? Why not keep going? Like, why not? You know, someone serving me food, someone me listening to a doctor, you know, um, right. that's, that's not authority. That's not hierarchy. That's right. I mean, OK. Now, I will say that there is a one of the things I like about Watari, especially is his kind of he wanted to destroy the hierarchy between like the psychiatrist or like the health, you know, expert and the, or like the, you know, like that, that, that kind of thing. And, and the subject, I guess, and, and have it more on a equal standing, higher, you know, horizontal standing. So, I mean, I definitely think it's just nothing like that. You know, it, me listening to a doctor is not, you know, the, to their advice on, you know, Hey, you might want to, you know, get vaccinated. Okay. That's not, you know, that doesn't have any authority over anyone. So mm-hmm. um, I think we just have to have a, a, a Solid definition of hierarchy, I guess, or else it becomes too broad and we just start justifying all of them. Mm-hmm. Or it becomes incoherent to the point of just like it being meaningless, like a meaningless. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. All right. So here's one of those memes, like I was saying earlier, I wanted to, to, to talk about one more meme that you made. This is one of those memes that would feel cynical to anyone who thought that the institution of policing is sacred or the institution of prisons or punishment are sacred. So this is like what's hilarious about your stuff. You'll put high ideas on like lowbrow backgrounds. <laughs> it's, it, it's really what it is, is a juxtaposition. And in that tension exists the comedy, I think. So the background is Jimmy Neutron. And <laughs> I don't know who these characters are. Because I I never watched Jimmy Neutron. I like fell off at like Doug and stuff. Oh my gosh, really? <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Let's see, what's the last cartoons I watched? Doug. Hey Arnold is probably the That's a good one. Yeah. I just I just found their whole season on DVD or like their whole <laughs> series on DVD. So definitely bought that. Awesome. Um but yeah, I, I um I I can see what you're saying about the kind of neo situationism with that. Sometimes I don't think about that, but yeah, I definitely have the, have a uh, you know Jimmy Jimmy Neutron show with like you know we're talking about fuck you Jimmy we're you know fuck cops <laughs> you know um, yeah I, you yeah know. let me so let me read it the first character says rats those cops who killed Brianna Taylor won't be indicted looks like there won't be justice after all and then the other character at a bo- at the bottom says Sheeb I guess the c- first character was Sheeb it says you don't get it Sheeb. Where will you hide the cops when we break the prison locks? What kind of justice will you miss when we burn the courthouses down and the judges and the prosecutors are chased into the depths of the sea? Cops arresting cops is a part of the spectacle. It doesn't challenge the underlying logic of policing and punishment. Will you continue to demand more arrests and policing or hurry to embrace a thousand exits from carceral justice? That's beautiful. It's beautifully said. It's beautifully articulated in front of such a hilarious lo-fi background. Yeah, I, I'm gonna be honest. I have no idea what started <laughs> that or what. I think I think I maybe saw one of those like Hugh Neutron things, and I was kind of I just kind of ran with that. I guess his kind of very dramatic approach, and you know, juxtaposed to his very. I mean, you, you've never seen the show, but he's a very like, especially Hugh. He's very silly. He's very like. He has a kind of very silly voice. I, I haven't actually mentioned this any. I think I maybe mentioned it on Twitter, but I, I actually I don't I don't remember where I actually did. But I, oh, maybe I didn't. I, I don't think I did. Okay, so 
surprise, I, I actually messaged uh, the the voice of Hugh Neutron, and I, oh I, I tried to convince him to kind of put some life to it. And he and he gave a whole response. Like he has a whole little thing. He's like, <laughs> he, I mean, he de- he declines, but he he kind of he kind of says, um, I I generally agree with you. And <laughs> like, wow, no way. Like, I showed a I showed an example or whatever, and he like, it was it was pretty interesting. Oh my god, that's so hilarious. He he begged me. He was like, hey, you gotta you gotta tell Nickelodeon to get us back on the air. You know, do a rewrite, <laughs> or whatever. I was like, okay. okay. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, kind of crazy. Uh, but yeah, I think that's part of the part of the fun with it is I, I, I also since, you know, you didn't see the show. His name's not she like I always I I used to be very so Jimmy Neutron. His whole thing is brain blast. Like that's what he has a couple phrases like got a blast and, and brain blast mm-hmm. and stuff. And I, I like to take phrases from other kind of things and make it kind of idiosyncratic, I guess. And like yabba dabba do or some shit and you know like, like that's not what he says that's not his name yeah you know i i don't know i just kind of make it a little silly i don't know and, and then kind of make the words super dramatic and like <laughs> i don't know i love it i love it i love where lowbrow meets like high intellect i guess like that's that's what i'm i guess going for i don't know i i literally am just yeah. kind of going with it somebody the people liked it i was like oh okay <laughs> this is if y'all get it too like i'm not the only one laughing i guess okay <laughs> uh, yeah let me let me um pose a not a challenge to the to the premise in the meme but just let me let me ask you something so as so as i take it this meme is saying that the desire for carceral solutions to police brutality beyond being anarchistic is fundamentally mistaken because it doesn't challenge the underlying logic of policing and punishment, just as you said in the meme. So I, I definitely agree with that perspective. However, I can also emotionally relate to the frustration in the original sentiment because I sort of intuitively just feel unwhole and unsettled when cops continue to murder people without any ramifications. So what can we do right now to, to satisfy people's instinct for justice while also challenging the underlying logic of policing and punishment? I, I totally get what you're saying. I think it's important not to kind of put these cops as kind of like the, the poster examples of prison abolition. You know, I think that's a terrible look and we should, we shouldn't be going that route. I think what you're asking, you know, the, the best thing to do is to destroy the prisons that we that their whole job revolves around. You know, if we don't have prisons, then they're not, you know, out here killing people. You know, they're not out here like trying to arrest them and then killing them if they, you know, refuse to be arrested or something, you know? And I think that's what'll put a stop to it. I, I totally understand. Like I, I'm not saying, you know, I'm I'm happy when cops go free or anything like that. I just think there's much better ways to approach justice or, you know, have a concept of justice without reproducing the, the same, you know, if you want to arrest all the cops, you know, it, the thing is, they can sit here and arrest the cop. And if it provides them some legitimacy, if it says, if it makes people think, oh, well, okay, there's cops in the prison, too. So I guess it's, you know, it's, it's fair, you know, it's not just, you know, it's justified, you know, and I don't know, I just think abolish prison, the more we destroy, the less cops will have the, the less legitimacy that prisons will have, I guess, and the whole role of policing, you know, will will fall with that, I guess. And that's that's our problem is the, the role of policing and punishment and carceral justice. And we just need to challenge that, I guess. And I guess the best way to do that is destroying prisons, tearing them down, you know, like we like we did last summer. You know, um, let's start with that. I think that's a good start, I guess. Mm-hmm. Something tells me, though, that your politics starts with the individual tearing down the prisons and the prison guard in their own mind first. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's, you know, the fundamental question of Spinoza and Deleuze is how does desire come to desire its own repression? And yeah, in order to attack the prisons, you have to attack first the legitimacy, the identities, the representations that have convinced us, I guess, that those are legitimate institutions. Beautiful, beautiful. All right. Well, I'm not sure how much you've actually listened to the podcast, but towards the end of these interviews, we like to do a lightning round where I list a series of 
people or ideas and have my guests respond to each item in one minute or less. You down to try that out? Yeah, let's do it. All right, first one on the list is God with a capital G. <laughs> oh, gosh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, like I said, I was raised very, like, conservative religious, and I am, I think I experimented with some other forms of, you know, kind of religious or mysticism or things, and I I just don't have any taste for it these days. I think even, even I know that Christian anarchism is, is a thing. I just think, you know, when we talk about obeying a God, like saying, hey, you know, you should be nice because this God said so, like, you know, I, I, or said it's, said it's just or something, then that's, that's when I, you know, I'm, I'm like, no gods, no masters, I guess, is my, my take on God. I've got to, if he did exist, we would have to destroy him, so. Prefigurative politics. Um, gosh, this is a, this is one that I kind of have been struggling with, not gonna lie. I definitely, like, have been kind of reading some criticisms of prefigurative politics, and I, to be real honest, like I have a, I have a feeling like something about it just reeks of Christian eschatology. And I mean, obviously I'm so tired of that. Like I just can't, I can't stomach it anymore. So it's things like that. Just, I'm kind of allergic to, I mean, I, I just feel like it has this projecting an image onto the future kind of, it, it just reminds me of yeah the eschatology I was raised with, I guess. Next item is dialectics. Dialectics. Gosh. Um, I mean, I think they're fundamentally like like a, like a tree, you know, kind of a root tree system with binaries and things like that. I mean, I just, I mean, you know, I, I mentioned Deleuze and Guattari and Stirner, and they were all extremely critical of, you know, the Hegelian dialectic and kind of it's, it's the meta narratives, I guess, it assigns. All right. So two more items. Next one is Spinoza. Spinoza. Um, <laughs> like I said, I'm, I'm very critical of God and kind of like the whole idea, but I don't know. I've been reading more of Spinoza, and I think, I'll just say, I think I need to read more before I have a take, but I, I liking maybe not like the, like, it, it seems like an alternative to like deism even, and like, I don't know. It's, it's, I'm kind of, like, I had an impression of it, I think, and now the more I kind of like actually like read into it, I'm kind of like, maybe it's not like I was thinking. I, um, the reason why I really got into Spinoza was because Deleuze is a big Spinoza fan. He's a big, I think I've probably said it two or three times now, I don't need to again, but the desire, you know, desire to repression. And that's, I guess that's what I share with Spinoza is I think that the fundamental problem with philosophy is that, you know, how does, how does desire desire its own repression? Um, and I think that's what we have to figure out. That's the task of philosophy, I guess. That is so fascinating. Last item is accelerationism. <laughs> wow. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not fond of it. Not fond of it. It's, it comes off to me as callous, as at least some interpretations of it, I guess, seem very callous to me in terms of, you know, like Shishek was like, hey, yeah, um, I would have voted for Trump because that's, you know, what would have, you know, kind of accelerated the conditions or whatever. And I definitely just think that that's just callous, like, you know, to, to not mm -hmm. feel anything about the harm that, you know, that might result from that. Like, yeah, okay, you might be saying the ends justify the means, I guess, but I think something about anarchism is means ends unity, I guess, is something I've mm. um, thought was admirable about anarchism, I guess. Yeah, absolutely. There's different types of accelerationism, right? Yeah. Yeah, there's left strains, right strains, I guess. Yeah. Nick Land, you know, Nick Land is obviously fucking, you know, you, you talked about, you know, schizo stuff or kind of a fascist and stuff. Like, yeah, absolutely. Like, I mean, Nick Land is probably your best example of that. Mm -hmm. Racist dude, absolutely. Let me visit his Twitter. Uh, gosh. But yeah. I feel like Deleuze and Guattari are, they lend themselves to accelerationism in a way, or a type of accelerationism that not only recognizes the complexity that we're already in, but maximizes it through the deterioration of the, the prisons that we create for ourselves, yeah. the identity prisons. It's like an acceleration of complexity at a, a on like a micro level, sort of. They do mention acceleration. I don't know that I, I don't know that you would describe them as accelerationists, you know, but sure, yeah, sure. absolutely. They, they're so I mean, the whole thing about schiz, schizophrenic kind of understandings, I guess, of that is like, 
you know, that there, there is no end or beginning. And yeah, I mean, they, they definitely like have a kind of acceleration is kind of thing, but like the, what it's turned into with like Nick land and the, you know, things like that is just doesn't seem like what they were talking about at all, I guess. It seems like something entirely different that they've kind of brought in some eschatological things in there, kind of snuck it in there, I guess. I don't know. I'm honestly not that well read on it. I just, my initial reaction and what I've seen of it is, seems kind of callous and seems kind of almost right, right wing, really, usually. Um, I definitely think maybe there's some left wing versions of it that are, that are okay, but, you know, like, like the Deleuze and Guitar maybe initially kind of uh, mint, I guess, but that they talk about, but yeah. I feel like you've actually already answered this question already. So if you do not want to expound on it or answer it at all, feel free to, to pass. But if you feel like you have something to add to sort of this reframing of a different question that I've asked you earlier, a listener question that we ask everyone is how can I get a cappuccino in your imagined political utopia? I think we will all have cappuccinos if that's what we want. I think we'll have the self-determination to get a cappuccino, to share a cappuccino with each other, to share the, the I don't know, the, the cappuccino machine or the, the resources, you know, to the espresso or, um, you know, whatever. I don't think that it's going to be, you're going to need a certain, that we're going to be obeying price signals, you know, or that, you know, we'll have to like vote on it, you know. Um, I just think that there's going to be a lot more sharing and crack brewing maybe of some a cappuccino yeah so all right so moving towards the actual end of our conversation here where should folks go if they want to learn more about some of the topics we've spoken about today the anarchist library i think is a good good place to go to if you're trying to get into books and whatever delusion guitaris anti oedipus is probably where i start but it kind of lays out what they're kind of talking about. And then a thousand plateaus is kind of their kind of experimentation in what they were talking about. Like the chapters are all kind of independent. Like they, they correlate to one another's and in, in, in a way that's not like traditional books, I guess, when they kind of stand on their own, they kind of want connections between the chapters to be kind of made organically spontaneously, I guess. So it's, that's, that's something I think is kind of cool. Oh, I mentioned Eric Hoffer. The True Believer is a really good one. Not even a long read, and it's actually full of, it's, it's all aphorisms, really. Maybe some lengthier paragraph ones, but, you know, it's, it's, it's a really good read. Really interesting, really thought-provoking. I think that's about it. How can anyone who is a fan of you and what you do, how can we financially support you? I am, like, extremely emphatic. Like, I do not want any sort of, like, financial donation or anything like that. I don't, I don't, I don't, you know, I'm not saying like Patreons are bad or anything. I, I totally believe in, you know, doing, doing what you got to do. I just, I don't want anything that this page is doing or I'm, I'm doing really to be corrupted by, you know, capital, whether that's social capital or what, but yeah, I want it to be about me processing my things and maybe, you know, some others, you know, learn some things I, I you know I, along the way i don't really know i i will say i do have an only fans if y'all want to go there uh that's, that's something you can do but um yeah that's about it you know i get by i make I, I pay my bills and i pay my rent and i'm good to go you know i work full time I, I just i just want this to be a fun project for sure for sure i totally respect that the facebook page is where i would recommend it's just the ghost of old Benjamin Tucker. Is there anything I forgot to ask you about that you'd like to touch on before we end the interview? You know, something something I'm really passionate about that I, I don't know that we've had a lot of time to discuss, the labor abolition. It's something I've always just been really passionate about. I don't think it's about just taking work and making it, you know, let's let's just kind of reform it. You know, it's it's let's make it as minimum as possible or let's let's make it as fun as possible or something. You know, I, I think it's about destroying the eth- the work ethic entirely. Anti-Puritan action. Yeah, yeah. I think the, the work ethic is something that even, even 
still informs whenever we talk about, you know, a minimal work society or something like that. I just, I, I believe that our activities should be liberated from work. You know, a lot of people will say, oh, you're, an, you're anti-work. Well, oh my gosh, like, you just want us to do nothing all day? Like, and I think that's part of the problem. That's, that's why, why anti-work anarchism, I think, is important because people have just conflated the two together and just said, oh yeah, work is activity now. And, and I think that's, the more we separate those things and say, you know, work, work is something entirely opposed to play. And by entering the ethic of play, we kind of reject this whole work ethic that we've been, been in, I guess. Yeah. I love it. I really do. I, I love the, the spirit of it, and I can relate to it deeply on an emotional level. I, I feel like I, I would consider myself anti-work to the extent that work has been sort of inflated or like has like monopolized all of our activity. My favorite books is Arm Joy by Alfredo Bonanno. Have you read it? I have, yes. That to me was like just that really convinced me about work and entering a new, like whole, whole different, like attitude when it comes to our activity that isn't, that doesn't have to do with work at all. It has to do, you know, more with play, you know, sure. and, and we, we interact and we, and we do things and we build things and we do things, but we don't, doesn't really have anything to do with work or like, you know, labor even. So. Well, I, I, I would love to see, Anti-work politics and, and ideas explored more. I can say that at minimum, I love the idea. It's one, one more prison to abolish. And it takes a lot of introspection, I guess, to realize the extent to which you've been hypnotized by the idea. Exactly. Well, cool. Ghost, thank you so much for joining me. I really appreciate you taking time out of your day to to do it. I think the audience is going to love to um, hear the voice behind the genius. That is the ghost of old Benjamin Tucker. Not my voice. so oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's my worst part. That's my worst attribute. <laughs> <laughs> but it was great. It was great. Thank you. I, I really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. It was a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. We'll talk to you soon. Judge Schrader has sunbeams in his ass. The fundamental problem of political philosophy is still precisely the one that Spinoza saw so clearly. Why do men? Why do men? Why do men? Why do men fight for their servitude as stubbornly as though it were their salvation? There it is, folks. I hope everyone enjoyed this installment of the show. If you liked this episode, be sure to check out our full catalog at nonserviamedia.com or at youtube.com slash nonserviamedia. And make sure to subscribe to receive notifications each time we release a new episode. If you're interested in seeing this project continue, please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com slash nonserviamedia. And if you can't contribute financially, you can help us out simply by liking and sharing this episode. As usual, shout out to our existing patrons. Your support helps us reach a larger audience and helps keep this project going. Finally, be sure to keep an eye out for the next episode. Thank y'all so much for tuning in. We'll talk to you soon.